welcome to another session of 4RG Meets, and we're so happy you could join us here again tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Scott McKinley, and my co-host is uh, Beth McKinley. And uh, tonight, our 4RG president, Guy Hanchette, is going to uh, join us, and he's going to talk about how we talk about climate change. Um, but first, a little bit about uh, 4RG. Uh, we are uh, Peterborough. Uh, Nogo Jiwanong based a climate action group whose mission is to inspire, inform, and mobilize people to take effective action in response to the climate crisis. You can check out our Facebook page, our Facebook group, Instagram, and also check out our website for lots of information and suggested actions. So many people will ask us, what can I possibly do about climate change? Um, and so this evening we'll be focusing on one of the more common answers, um, and that is the importance of talking about it. But I also came across a really great TED talk the other day by uh, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, and she's also written a book. Um, and she suggests that you ask yourself three questions to help find your place. So number one, what needs to be done for climate and justice solutions? So what needs to be done and what are you good at? So your skill set, your resources, what are your networks? And finally, what brings you joy, satisfaction, and delight? Um, and so it's the intersection of those three questions, what needs to be done, what you're good at, and what brings you joy. That's where uh, your place could be. And this might result in you wanting to join one of our For Our Grandchildren committees. <laughs> we have several political action, communications, event planning, if you're the least bit interested, please reach out to us via our website or through this email address, and uh, you'll be connected with Connie McCracken, and she will take some time to have a chat with you and just find out if there's a place for you in our group. So 4RG Meets is a monthly meeting, if you haven't been here before, where we get together to learn, to discuss, to learn from one another, to ask questions. All of our presentations are recorded and uploaded onto our website. And right now we have an almost two year long catalog of really good um, presentations with amazing presenters. Next month's topic will be about dealing with eco grief and eco anxiety. So we'll start with the land acknowledgement that will be offered by John Woodger. Okay, we respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough is located on the Treaty 20 in Michisagig territory and the traditional territory of the Michisagig and Chippewa nations collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations and for our grandchildren respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. Great. Thank you, John. I would like to turn things over to Al Slavin um, to introduce um, everyone to Guy. So this is a real pleasure. Uh, Linda, my wife and I have known Guy now for quite a few years, all through for our graduate, and that's where it all started. But of course, things started before that. In 2006 in Toronto, a group got together to form uh, the organization for our grandchildren. Um, most of them at least were grandparents at that time. And Guy was part of that early group. Uh, he moved to, to Peterborough area, now living in Lakefield. Sometime, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was around around 2012. Uh, and uh, shortly after that, organized the sort of first organizing meeting of four grandchildren in Peterborough. And uh, that happened in 2013. So this is, in fact, our 10th anniversary year uh, of four grandchildren in this area. And over that time, he has been chair of the local four grandchildren organization. Uh, he's been not just chair, but he's been an inspiration, a driving force in what we've been doing. He also has been the, the main force until very recently now be, behind our, our web activities. Uh, luckily, we have a group of very, very talented people who are now helping out with those, including Scott and Beth, who you see here, who are doing the 4RG meets, but other people as well behind the scenes who are doing you know Instagram and trying to get as broad a outreach as possible. But Guy has been there always, just keeping us moving, keeping us motivated, thinking of things we should be doing, uh, challenging us to, to, to go more broadly, at the same time, working locally. Uh, just ask Guy 
a little bit about the uh, proposed Selwyn gas pipeline, and he can keep it going for another hour. So <laughs> he, he has been a great pleasure to work with, a real friend, and it's a real honor to be able to welcome Guy to this presentation. I'm sure I know we will all learn a lot. Thank you, Guy. So I guess that's my cue to, uh, to, to start talking. So um, Beth says this was my idea to do this presentation. I, I thought it was her idea and I went along with it, but uh, whatever, I did agree to do it. And I, at first I thought it was going to be kind of an extension of my, my own personality, which is like, let's teach everybody how they can smash people down when they come up with an idea, when they want it, when you want to have a discussion. I'm just going to share my screen now though, so it can uh, keep me a little bit more on track. So here it is. Uh, it starts with the program for tonight, and we've already gone through that. So I'm going to go to this thing here, which is, is kind of the, the 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 visual background to what I'm saying right now. I first agreed to do this, and I thought I'd be talking about the cranky uncle application. You can see it over here. It's limited, It's it's indicated here. I thought I'd be doing that. I got uh, Richard Peachy to draw us a local uh, a local climate change uh, cranky uncle. And uh, I started getting ready to do it that way. And I had the book, I'm right and you're an idiot. And I didn't look at the subtitle of that. And so I thought I'm gonna be really happy, having fun. I'm gonna be smashing people and my eloquence and my compassion is going to convince people that I'm right and that they're an idiot and that they should change their mind. But uh, you can probably guess that it's not really a very effective way of doing things. And every little bit of research that I did into what should happen showed that that's not the right idea. It's just really not the way to go. Uh, much better off to do something where you don't talk. And this little diagram down here that talks about the secret of talking about climate change, the secret, well, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but there is a secret to talking about climate change. Um, so the what I found was that there were a couple of sources that were really reliable for this. One of them was the David Suzuki Foundation website, which has a whole page devoted to how to communicate with people about climate change. And the other one, which they refer to, is Catherine Hayhoe. And Catherine Hayhoe is a, is a really wonderful person. She's a Canadian uh, from Toronto. She now lives in Texas. She's a... Uh, a, a um, uh, quite a solid Christian and she she teaches evangelical Christians about climate change and she has talked about communicating talking about climate change as being the most important thing that we can do and we've been saying that for quite a while here but we haven't really tried to say well how can you go about doing it so I'm going to go down to, to this page here and say before you start trying to talk to somebody about climate change you need to know yourself you need to be yourself when you when you're having a, a conversation about climate change. You need to know why it is that you care and what it is that you want. And I think some people have seen these seen these people on the right hand side. Those are those are the people who those. That's the reason why I care about climate change. I'd like to have a livable world for those children, the my grandchildren. And uh, other things that people want is to be prepared for and protected from the impacts of extreme weather events and all the things that you can read on here. What you need to do before you go out and try and talk with people is to know what it is that you want, to know what it is that you, who you are. Why do you care? If you want to be able to establish a relationship with somebody, you need to know why you care so that they, you, can, you can talk to them and maybe they can share some of that. And before, in addition, you need to, people are, are a little bit frightened about going out to the, uh, to, to talk about climate change because they think they're going to be overwhelmed by not knowing the science. And you do need to know the science, but I'm going to put up a slide here that shows all you really need to know about the science. And that is those five bullet points there. It is getting hotter. We've known about it for a long time. This fellow over here is uh, 200 years ago, proposed the theory of why it might get hotter if we keep burning fossil fuels. Humans are the cause. You can see that because you can see here the concentrations of carbon dioxide, which trickled along at about 280 for thousands of years, have shot up since we started burning coal in, the, in 1850 or so. The side effects are bad. We don't really know just how bad they are, but we know they're bad. And this 
t-shirt over here says we can fix it, but I don't think fix is quite the right word, but we can make a difference. Things are changing and we can make a difference with our own actions. So the next slide I'm gonna show talks about how to start a conversation. And Beth was talking about, or the question that we asked everybody is if you know about active, uh, if, you, if you know about um, communications, if you know about what it means to have an active listening. And active listening means you have open-ended questions. You ask questions and you listen to the answer. You need to have your own questions about how to start a, a, a conversation and you need to be creative and you need to practice. And here's some samples of open questions that are out, that, are, that could possibly introduce the, the, uh, the, the topic of climate change to somebody. How have you been affected by heat waves? What concerns you about the security of jobs? How do you feel about climate strikes that the youth are leading around the world? Open questions, which are, there are questions that cannot be answered by yes or no. They're questions that need to be engaged with a little bit more. They typically begin with something that says what, how, where, when, why, or who. Here's some things that uh, Catherine Hayhoe and others say we should try to avoid. Catherine Hayhoe says, don't even bother engaging with the 7% of the population who's just not gonna listen at all, turn away. Don't engage with zombie facts. Zombie facts, she has a whole lot of talk about what are zombie facts. Zombie facts are things like, we're, we, we don't matter, we're a tiny country, or ice sheets are, are, are actually growing in the Arctic. Don't even answer those questions, pivot away from them. And don't expect a conversion, but expect hope for perhaps a relationship with the person you're trying to have a conversation with. Here's two, two sources that I'm referring to here. Skeptical science, if you really want to go and burrow down on the zombie facts and find out what the truth is, go to skeptical science and you'll find out how, how what, the, what the facts are. But don't do it while you're engaging with somebody. It is just a recipe for getting into an argument. And this guy over here, the cranky uncle, probably not worthwhile getting into into his his head as well either so the trick the the goal here this is the heart of the of what i want to say is we want to bond and connect and you'll see two different ways of of, of people talking about that get to know what somebody else cares about ask lots of questions really listen to those questions. And I have to say, this is not something that comes naturally to me. My first reaction when somebody talks to me about something is to come up with a, a reason why they're wrong, you know, and a way, a way to get started to show that one, but it's not an effective way. Ask lots of questions, really listen, listen deeply to understand. Don't listen to come up with an answer. Acknowledge what they're saying. And there's where active communications is. Acknowledge what people say to you, reflect it back to them and summarize what they said and validate their perspectives and say, yes, I hear what you're saying. It sounds to me like you think this. I think I agree. Is that what you mean? Eventually, if you keep probing like that, you'll be able to find something in common. And practice something from improv theater, which is yes and. So instead of saying yes, but, you say yes and, and you can extend conversations by doing that. And what they, uh, what uh, Catherine Hayhoe talks about is inspiring people. And by inspiring, my interpretation of what inspiration is, is it's not to talk to people about how polar bears are drowning, but to focus on positive actions, actions that other people have taken, and to try to find something that you might be willing to do yourself and that the person you're trying to have a communication with might also do. And then highlight, here's some ideas that are clearly, I think most people would think there should be health benefits. So we need to highlight what the health benefits exist as a positive result of taking climate action or highlight cost savings of buying an electric vehicle and talk about the side benefits of environmental issues. And on page 230 of Catherine Hayhoe's book, there's lots of other ideas. And the little cartoon that I'm showing here, which, I, we've, which has been around for quite some time, shows some of the positive effects of, doing, of taking action on climate. Some of those things, or one of those things, might, you might have in common with anybody you want to talk to. That's, I'm not gonna try and go into details about active listening. I'm not an expert, but what we are gonna do next is have a little role play where we're gonna have the cranky uncle who's gonna be played by Scott. We're gonna have Captain Climate Change 
It was going to be played by me with my climate change hat on. And we have two examples here of Captain Climate Change. The one in orange over here, down here is Glenn Caridus. And this is a picture of me sitting on the grass somewhere. And here's the cranky uncle that Scott's going to be. And here's another vision of the, of the cranky uncle, which we had Richard Peachy draw for us to have a local, uh, a local view of what the crabby, a cranky uncle might look like. In addition in the cast, there's the voice of reason. And the voice of reason will be played tonight by Beth. Always the voice of reason. Always the voice of reason. We would like to uh, invite you to join a um, breakout room. So what we'd like to do before Cranky Uncle and Climate uh, Captain Climate get going is um, if you wouldn't mind raising your virtual hands, um, if one person uh, made notes or would like to speak on behalf of the group. So just raise a virtual hand. We'd love to hear what your answer to question number one was. What makes conversations about climate difficult for you? To the first question, um, conversations difficult um, that are difficult, I had some interesting ideas. Um, one was that it's hard to speak to family members in particular. Friends are often people of like minds. Family members in particular who have rather right-wing perspectives. And so how do you sort of take that on? Is it best, you know, it's, it's often been, we've been trained to avoid family confrontations. Another is that we are intimidated by the science. So to get involved, you know, um, in a conversation, how to get involved in, in the science and not being a, an expert sort of holds people back. Right. And then someone else had family that really weren't even paying attention, weren't kind of interested. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Those were, those were really okay. important points. And we are actually gonna talk especially about the science one a little bit later on. Okay, Mark, and so who's next there? Mark, Mark, Mark Bullock. Things that weren't, uh, weren't ha haven't already been said. Um, it can be depressing. Kind of lands like a thud in the room sometimes. Somebody used the word, the phrase buzzkill or word buzzkill, which you know seemed appropriate. And and sometimes people, when you start talking about solutions, they feel judged mm. if they're not walking to work, for example, or turning down the thermostat or whatever it is. Um, so those were two more that we had. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely there. Yeah, that judgy one is an interesting one. I had a neighbor who uh, was apologizing to me that they were planning to go on a camping trip this winter. And I was just like, uh, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, great. So I think Cheryl Lyons next in line there. Uh, the, uh, in my group, um, uh, I had the second question, uh, what's most difficult to respond to? So I might uh, defer to Donna Lockhart, who had the first question. Oh, OK. OK, great. fair enough. Thank you. John uh, Widger. Okay, very quick. We just talked about the first one, and we made the observation that uh, we were always told to not discuss politics and religion in groups, and the environment is completely and utterly political. And then a uh, follow-up component to that is that we live in a day and age where the populace is very angry, and both sides are fed by their own echo chambers, and there's basically no um, communication between the two various groups. And so that's sort of what we reflected on for a while. And I guess that's what we're trying to accomplish tonight is figuring out ways to bridge that gap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alison Hobbs then with question one of that group. Because no one is going to okay, I was in the group with uh, Peter and Nicole. And uh, this was one or two of the things I noted down. When you're talking to people, it seems they just don't care. Or they confronted with a, uh, the fact that they've got to change their lifestyle totally and they don't want to acknowledge that. They also don't want to acknowledge that we might be close to what uh, one, one person called Armageddon. People don't like change. They, they don't uh, have the patience to listen to these arguments. And also the, the, there doesn't seem to be any political will to do anything about it. So all this is very negative really. And the counter arguments, people say the, the weather has always been always been variable. <laughs> so they basically don't believe what the scientists are saying. Right. And um, I, I think it was um, uh, Peter who said he'd come across someone who uh, thought David Suzuki was, was an absolute criminal. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Making I, money and the rest I, of it. Myself, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll halt you there and then we'll thank, uh, you. thank you very much for that. And then uh, Donna, I think you're up next, Donna Lockhart, if you could uh, answer that question, give us an example from question one. 
so it's challenging. I was trying to find how to do the hand thing. So I'm not sure if I'm going to repeat some, but maybe that's not a bad you know, <laughs> thing to do. But what, one thing that we do know is that people are confused between climate and weather. And I think that certainly that that makes that start off of it because they, they think it's the same. I think that one was different from the rest of the group. Um, another is it's happening far away. So they don't associate, well, you know, it's China that's got, or Florida that's got the, the coal burning um, things happening. So it's not here. We gave that up. So, you know, it's far away. Um, and people have, a, I think, have a really hard time understanding that that climate change is happening if they can't feel it or touch it or uh, don't see that it's happening in the immediate environment that that they're in. So I think those ones were maybe different from what we've uh, heard the others say. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, everyone. Yeah. I, is there any groups that didn't give a response? Got something from everybody? All right, super. All right. Um, where are we going here next? I, climate I, th I think we're at this point, um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll reflect on some of those comments and, and things later. Um, but I think right now we're going back to climate, Captain Climate Change and a, a little bit of role playing here going on. Hey, Guy, uh, you know, what do you think of this nice weather? I think they're going to open the golf courses early this year. Yeah. I'm not so I'm not so fond of it. Uh, don't you realize that this is just one aspect of climate change that's warming the world and it's going to destroy civilization as we know it? Oh, come on, really? I mean, you tree huggers are all the same. You think we can just fix it with a few solar panels, some windmills? Stop being such a sheep and think for yourself for a change, Guy. You just want to suck that joy out of everything. Yeah, you with your probably have a big SUV and you're a big major contributor to the problem. Get on with the program. Get on the program. Yeah, well, my SUV is going to beat your Prius any day. So, uh, you know, unless you ride a bike everywhere and raise your own food, don't even talk to me about climate change. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Captain Climate and my cranky uncle. <laughs> Let's just step back for a second and take a moment to look at the slide um, that Guy presented us about uh, effective conversations. Um, and I'll invite our participants uh, to comment on what Captain Climate and our cranky uncle did not do in their conversation. So Guy is screen sharing. Uh, these are the recommendations from climate commuters about what communicators about what you should do. So people wouldn't mind raising their hand if they want to comment on what of which of these points you didn't see or you did see that would be great. Where, where did we go wrong? <laughs> did we do anything right nobody's got anything to say <laughs> they're just appalled <laughs> there's kim all right kim yeah they didn't listen to each other at all no there was no listening. not in the least yeah i see jeff's got something to say too <laughs> cheryl uh i i i didn't hear uh validation of the other person's feelings and, and naming how they feel. Tell me how you, you know, get that word out there about how you feel. That's kind of the first step in, in uh, de-escalating at least a conversation, naming the feeling. And then you can take the next steps that are suggested on the, uh, on the bond and connect thing. Yeah, for sure. Makes sense. Donna. I think the only question I heard was about the weather and the golf course. So that was <laughs> a leading question, but the rest of it is just my position and your position, like the, the back and forth banter that we often hear, that the I'm right, you're wrong kind of feeling. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's give these two clowns, I mean, clowns people <laughs> a <laughs> second clowns. chance <laughs> to apply some of these steps. Conversation, take two. <laughs> <laughs> so, Guy, don't you just love this weather we're having? I think they're going to open the golf courses uh, early this year. Yep. It's beautiful and warm, isn't it? I really love it. Sure is. I can't, I can't wait. I'm not much of a golfer myself, but I do love skiing on the golf course, and I love walking in the woods and listening to the birds. Oh, yeah, I love the birds, uh, especially like the cardinals. Do you get any cardinals around where you are, Guy? 
Uh, we got lots of cardinals here. They mostly live just a little bit south, but I love the cardinals. I didn't even know what a cardinal sounded like before I moved here. Cool. Um, Did you know, though, Scott, that, I mean, uh, Uncle, that, uh, that birds are having a tougher time finding food when they arrive in spring these yep. days? Why is that? Well, I'm not really an expert, but my friend Drew knows a lot about it. He's been keeping track of birds and when they arrive in the Kawarthas for decades. He says that in the last few years, birds are arriving and the insects that they usually have to eat when they arrive are not available. So many of the birds starve. Why is that going on? Well, Drew's a very cautious person about saying he's absolutely sure, but he thinks that our changing climate is partly to blame. Right, climate, okay. So uh, you think, uh, isn't that like, seriously, I mean, do you really buy into that? I mean, it's Chinese and Al Gore and all the rest of that, really? Well, I, I don't think it's just that because we can sort of see it around here in, in Peterborough. You, you're, you're seeing it where the golf course is probably possibly gonna open pretty soon. That's not normal. If we look farther away, even here in Canada, we can see forest fires, heat waves on the West Coast. Yeah, there've been those before, but there's way more of them than there used to be. And even though we have a lot of water here in Peterborough with the Otonabee River running through it, it's possible that your golf club might run out of water some summer. Seriously? You think all those things are because of climate change? Well, I understand. I hear that you're not convinced. And I don't think I would say that it's all caused 100% by climate change because there's always variability in the weather. There's always cold winters, always uh, warm summers, but they're getting more frequent and all the time. In the long term, the climate is changing. Do you remember when we were younger and we used to be able to go out skating on the canal when we were uh, when we were just wanted to go out and play a game of hockey? Winters were longer, and we could skate and play outside all the time. Yeah, the weather has changed, but weather's always changing, and you know we can't do anything about it. All right, time. Let's go back to our audience and hear what you folks think about uh, the second uh, round. Can I get you to throw that slide up again? Um, and yeah, what did they, what do you, how did it feel to be um, a witness to that conversation and what do you, what did you think they did better and where do you think this conversation might go next? Uh, Allison, thank you. Yes, well, that was encouraging, much better. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, I really liked what happened at the end there uh, when, um, when Guy said, uh, do you remember, do you remember when we were young? That was establishing a bond between uh, him and his friend, so. It's worth pointing out that that, that might be the end of the conversation, mm -hmm. right? So you've mm -hmm. shared a little bit, I've gained a little bit of information from Guy, Guy's passed a little bit of information on and uh, he's heard me, uh, we bonded a little bit and, and maybe we're gonna go talk about the Blue Jays now and let, let that thing drop, but at least it's, it's in my head. But if it was to go on, um, if you were if you were in that conversation with me, wh where would you take it next? Any suggestions? Yeah, Jeff. Jeff and Wendy. At that point, as you say, you don't want to go on and on, but just to say, well, if you ever want to talk about it again, I, I you know, I love talking about these things, as you know, kind of just to leave it more open for another day. So an invitation, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And or, that you actually do want to have the conversation again. You didn't <laughs> annoy each other so much that. <laughs> yeah. And also, you had mentioned I have a friend who knows a lot about birds, Drew. And, you know, you could also say, hey, if you ever want to read something about that, you know, I could send you a link or something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Donna. I was, I was thinking something very similar. It's the cardinal connection and right. that. Probably, you know, a great opportunity to go together to the golf course and then, you know, uh, ask the cranky uncle. So are you noticing, oh, you or you had cardinals in your backyard. Have you noticed any changes? And the uncle may say, well, no, I haven't here, but but he could have taken them somewhere else or shown them some data information about the decrease of cardinals or you know, that that kind of thing. That little bit of follow up and some reading just might reinforce that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take that bond and that connection and go with it where it's going to naturally go because now you know what the other person cares about because you listened. <laughs> um, Marilyn. Just whiffing on, on what you just said, I think for me, when I'm in these situations, keeping it personal 
nobody can deny what my emotions are. And if I talk about how I'm feeling, uh, they can they can deny it or they can say, oh, I never thought about it that way or whatever. But they can't say, no, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they can. I don't know. <laughs> so keep it personal. <laughs> it's family. Maybe they can. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well said. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Cheryl. I, I think um, it's uh, a good ground to begin uh, oh, an opening to uh, talking about climate change is nature. Uh, we all can relate to cardinals and blue jays. Where it gets really hard is when you have to take it to the underlying causes, uh, particularly our economic system. Yeah, There's where you really start to hit the wall and it becomes very difficult. Um, we can do things, you know, for birds and swamps and all of that. But behind all of this is basically how we live in, in an economic system that is creating those problems. And that's where it really, really gets challenging. Yeah, the underlying assumptions that we often don't talk about. Yeah, um, I wonder how many on the call are familiar with the, uh, the, the donut economics. Um, if you're not, I'll, if it's okay, I'll put a link into the uh, the chat box because it's a really, really interesting way and a very quick graphic for understanding um, the role of the economy in this uh, overshoot, this climate overshoot that we have. Sure, I'll put a, I'll, I'll add that to the list of resources at the end. Yeah, I'll, good. Um, there, I'll add it for you. But uh, yeah, donut economics by Kate yeah. Woolworth. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, I think they also describe that as a circular economy. Is that the same thing? Uh, no, 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 it's different. Okay. okay, Cheryl, I think we'll be calling you about another uh, presentation. <laughs> Donuts. <laughs> Donuts. Um, Kate Gerson. Oh, um, sometimes um, I, in conversations, uh, I think all that was wonderful talking about local conditions and common shared um, viewing of changes, but sometimes when um, you want to move over into sort of the credible science. I've often referred people to NASA, which I don't think has, um, feels quite as political to a lot of people. Mm. No, it's American, but um, I think NASA is often viewed as kind of a neutral scientific organization, and uh, they have tremendous resources uh, on their website about uh, the facts of climate change. And uh, so I've often referred people to look at the NASA website. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Yeah, so we're going to move on um, to how Guy continued a similar conversation. Um, I think before I pass that back to you, Guy, um, one thing that I've really learned over the last uh, few years, to not overlook the influence that we have on one another, that, um, you know, we're social creatures. <laughs> and when somebody else cares about something, we might not always want to acknowledge that they've changed our mind depending on our positions, but, um, you know, grumpy uncle might think about this in a slightly different way because he was treated respectfully by the climate. Um, so Guy, over to you then. Um, how did you continue? So it, it, I, I, I put, I, I, when we were talking about this, I, uh, I, I said, well, I did have a conversation with somebody who's a golfer about this not too long ago. And I said, here's how I remember the conversation finishing, but I'm a little bit reluctant to talk about it because she's on this call. So I'm hoping I'm not gonna make, a, make, a, make something wrong, but I'm gonna tell what I think is the truth, Patty, which is uh, when, you, when she said, oh, I'm, I'm thinking I wanna do something at my golf course. She said, well, I think I'm gonna try to convince my golf club to use less water in their, in their operations and use less energy in their operations. And I wanted to say, what's the point of that? That's no damn good at all. You golfers, you're taking up all the room and you're just doing nothing good. But it was really a great, a great oh. idea. There she is, hey, Patty. I really appreciated <laughs> what you had to say that day. And what I would, might possibly say to Scott would be to say, you could talk to Patty and maybe you could get your golf course to do this, to do something similar. Do you think you might be able to do something like that? It's, yeah, yeah. And it's, Suggestions like that that are uh, that yeah people people find one little thing that you can do and and now they're just a little bit more on side right and they see things in a slightly different way so 
Yeah. And it's kind of like, I know Cheryl, I know what you're saying. It's like turning off, turning down the water on a golf course is like, boy, that's not donut economics, but it's something that, that Patty is willing to do. And maybe somebody else is willing to do it too. And maybe that'll be the, the starting point of making, getting them to be able to talk about it and to do something that's a little bit more. Patty, did you have any input that you well, want? It, it was interesting because Dee, Dee and I were sitting on a, a bench in Lakefield with my two big dogs running around. It was the first time we'd met each other. And and the fact that I was a golfer was not like a, a big plus in Guy's mind. But uh, it's interesting because before this, um, this call, I was just on a Zoom with um, Jack, Henry, quiet, uh, Jackie Donaldson at uh, Green Economy Peterborough, which we are now a founding member of and have been for uh, the last couple of years. And we just uh, submitted an application to Audubon International to pursue our certification, which will be a long-term process. Hen this is my dog, Henry. Henry, shh. Uh, and, but we've been working on it for two years behind the scenes, and, and it finally went through to our board as if it was a brand new idea that they'd come up with. So sometimes you have to just plant the seeds, as you were saying earlier, and just sort of watch them grow and keep nudging people along, because eventually... If you're persistent enough, things do start, the ship does start to uh, to turn. So we haven't figured out the water thing yet, but uh, uh, there are a lot of things we're doing that uh, are pretty exciting. And so I think sometimes we, we, we overthink what we can say to each other, you know? And if you just start talking and do a lot of listening, you do establish a bond that uh, the people can sort of move with you. And I've joked with, with Guy about this since. Because I, I did remember very clearly that conversation. So yeah, so thanks. <laughs> Always happy to share that, Guy. Thanks, thanks, Patty, for backing me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. And I, I, somebody also mentioned earlier that we were taught you we were talking about this. Al, I think you did talking about the Selwyn pipeline. Well, Patty and I are working uh, together here locally in Lakefield to try to con try to block the pipeline and uh, that, that's coming up from Buckhorn to, to to Lakefield. I don't think we're going to succeed, but we're going to. We're now going to, I, we're, we're going to go down better. fighting. <laughs> I'm very optimistic. I see T-shirts that say "We did it." So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just looking at the time, and often at eight o'clock, we'll, um, you know, sort of formally wrap up um, if people have to move on to something else. And thank people for coming. However, we have a couple more things that we wanted to do. We wanted to revisit. Um, well, we wanted to hear what you had to say about uh, that second question in the Zoom room. Uh, what arguments about climate do you find hard to respond to? And Scott and Guy were going to um, talk about that a little bit. And then the other thing that we wanted to do was Guy has the last few um, points in your presentations. I'm going to ask everybody to speak to at least one person in your life about climate change in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to ask you to post the results of that conversation on the 4RG Facebook group or page. And uh, I, I don't know how to do that, but apparently if you go into Facebook and look for For Our Grandchildren and join the group, you can post the results of your conversation. So just go and do that, see what, see how it works out. If it's a chance conversation that you have in the line at the, at the, at the, uh, at the supermarket, that's fine. If it's when you go talk to your cranky uncle for real, that's, that's really great. So there, I've taken off the page, a uh, part of that slide. And the last slide that I had was the resources that I wanted to point out to people. And this will be available. What we wanted to do now is move into um, some of those difficult questions. And so somebody brought this up, or actually a few of you uh, brought up that whole question of, you know, people being intimidated by science, and then some people not believing science. And then there's just well, Scott and I were both high school science teachers and you know, there's a bunch of people that were not paying attention in grade 10 science when we taught them the difference between climate and weather. <laughs> uh, Mark. We talked about issues that people bring up that are particularly difficult to address or challenging to address. Um, one of them is that people will sometimes say, well, you know, you're, you're trying to cut people's individual carbon emissions, but the real problem is population. Um, that's an issue that, 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 uh, that sometimes is difficult to talk about, difficult to deal with. Um, a lot of people love to travel and 
see travel, in many cases, retiring people see travel as the reward, the fulfillment of a lifetime. You know, they've put in all these years of work and now's their chance to really live. And what do they want to do? They want to travel. And it's a very difficult, it raises very difficult, hard conversations about, you know, how is that a is that a good thing to do these days? Is that a moral thing to do? Is that something you should be just cutting out or are there compromise? It's just very difficult to talk about. Um, we had a bunch of other ones too. Um, well, maybe oh, we, okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say maybe we just give one or two for each. Sure, group. that's great. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Those are awesome ones. Yeah, those are ones that I've had as well. People, you know, bring up and and well, the travel one is ones I've, I've struggled with, in fact, as well myself. Yeah. So okay, let's get a few more. I'll make notes of these questions and then we'll pass this over to Scott and you to take on one of these and then we'll open that up to everyone else. Okay. So Cheryl. Cheryl. Uh, yeah, um, three, uh, thinking that it's too late, uh, despairing in, in, in a sense, uh, we're so screwed, um, do what we want, you know, there's no use acting, we're, we're, we're already over the hill, and what difference can one person, one community, one country make? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely, good ones, so, okay. And then uh, Kim and Greg. Trying to unmute there. Um, one person talked about how individuals can actually be pro-oil mm. and even make statements like, well, you know, the alternatives will be just as bad. It's just sort of blanket statements. And Steve talked about, you know, going um, to a reunion with uh, people he went to school with who are all involved in the advertisements for big oil mm -hmm. and uh, how to make conversation and engage with them. So those will be challenging things for sure. And I also um, find it challenging to talk to people who are apolitical, like they and proud of it, not wanting to talk about things, don't watch the news, um, and really just seem to be gladly unaware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. That was one that Tammy raised when we were in the main room that, you know, for some people, it's easier to stick your head in the sand because it's just too much. Okay, okay so was, yeah. is there somebody is there else? else that had one that you wanted to share before we deal with a couple of those? Okay. Guy, you got one of those you'd like to tackle. Why don't, why don't you just assign me one? I, I've already forgotten what they were, so. Oh, well, I can read them over and I'm sorry if no, I- No, just, 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 just read me one and tell me to do it. Individual impact um, versus growing population on earth. Oh boy, that's a really tough one, Cheryl. It's, and, it, and it's like, there's, there's truth on all the sides of all of these things but we all have to do our, we all can do our little part. And the way I'm trying to phrase things these days is to not say, do it for the planet, but just say, do it for yourself. For example, go buy yourself an electric vehicle. It's gonna be less expensive. Buy yourself a bicycle because you'll get fitter by riding your bicycle than you will by just taking your, your, your car and you'll save some money. Or put an air source heat pump because you'll you, by, if you get gas out of your house, you'll probably save money in the long run and you'll stop bringing poison into your house. So I try to suggest to people that this is the kinds of things that I'm willing to do for, for me because I find that it helps me to, to, to make my family's health a little bit better and to save a little bit of money for my family. And by the way, it helps the environment as well. Right. Very good. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? How would you respond to people saying, you know, why should I worry about reducing my impact when, you know, the Earth population is predicted to be another, you know, two or three billion? Uh, Donna. I was going to say, I have done something similar to what he does. And I started with the question of, do you have grandchildren? And 99 times out of 10, they will say, yes, I do have grandchildren. I'll say, well, what kind of world do you want them to live in? And they'll talk about it. And then they'll look at me and say, like, why? Do you have grandchildren? I said, no, I don't. But I want to do it like for your grandchildren. So when they see someone who doesn't have grandchildren, but they want to leave the world. And my grandmother used to have that saying, and I bet you guys have heard this, leave the world a better place than when you found it. And there's a lot in our generation that I think can connect with that. And you just see them going away. Oh yeah, what can I do? So 
that's just something I've tried that I've found has made the connection. But also it's like, wow, pe people are wanting to leave the world a better place for others. We, even if we don't have grandchildren and whatnot that, that are going to pass it on, somebody does. We're, we're, we're right part of the, the world of people. So, yeah. Yeah, I think those are really important. Um, okay, we'll pass it over to Scott. Do you? Sure, I'll I'll, uh, I'll take a shot at the, uh, the the pro oil the people that employed in the oil industry and and that are well, basically pro oil pro oil. Um, one thing that is become more and more apparent is that that well we, we first of all we have to. We have to point out that it needs to be a just transition. We can't just cut off the taps. Nobody, nobody is suggesting that we just cut off the taps. And so there does have to be a transition. And then acknowledging that um, helps with some of the people. And then pointing out that that there are now more green, so-called green jobs on the planet than there are oil-based jobs. It, it, we we crossed that that boundary where there's there's more jobs in renewables. Um, and so some people aren't aware of that and that, that this change has happened, that there's a good number of oil workers that are being employed uh, or, and trained first to, to work in the green energy. And, and they might argue about wages and they might argue about, well, there's not gonna be enough electricity and all kinds of reasons that that's not gonna work. But you know, I just bring them back to the point that what we're doing isn't going to work either. And so what's, what's your solution? Do we just keep using oil? Um, or do we try to make a, a wider range of, of solutions and hopefully we can solve any problems that come up as they come along, as long as we concentrate on them. Yeah, and I think too that, you know, when we were planning this presentation, Guy and Scott and I, um, and we were looking at this question here, you know, we're not trying to suggest that we get into like a fact debate that we, have noticed that people have well and some of you said that they feel intimidated by the science and so if someone like le like legitimately says you know i really want to understand why canada should do anything in your opinion when china's not doing anything you know for me it's been helpful to have an, like an argument or, or not an argument but you know well a way of responding you know canada can be a leader and we have the you know we have a lot of resources, we have a lot of uh, knowledge so that we can be a leader. Um, and so, yeah, but to go back to Guy's point that we're that the listening is the number one starting place. And um, so you might not be able to get into these sorts of um, comments, but it might be helpful to have something in your back pocket if someone legitimately asks you one of these questions. I used I used the word pivot when I was when when and we talked about that Scott and Beth and I talked about pivoting and it's something that's kind of distasteful because it's what polit politicians do when they just don't want to answer the question but you just don't answer the question and you answer with some other thing that is along the lines of what you want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. We had a, a, a politician actually come to the door and it got around to climate change surprisingly and uh, and he said something about. Um, yeah, well, they tried to go electric in Germany, and as a result, they're burning more coal now because they're trying to make more electricity, and it's worse than it was before. And I'm like, it's the first time I'd ever heard that argument, so I didn't have the facts. And uh, yeah, so it, it kind of came back to, well, you know, still we have to make changes. We can't just keep plowing ahead. And then it turned out when I looked it up later, he was wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, to, I think we also did say to him, you know, it sounds like you don't trust the government, like just acknowledging that that's what he was feeling yeah. and going back through that, you know, empathetic, active listening that he is talking about. Yeah. And uh, Al, Al has something you to got say. your hand up and you're yes. muted. There you go. Or the people, or the people who say, well, you know, we're too small to make any difference. What can one person do? I think a really good rejoinder is to say, oh, is it OK if one person litters? Mm because everybody knows that littering is a problem, is a cumulative problem. And if every if everybody litters, you've got a real mess. And in fact, letting your greenhouse gases go off into the atmosphere is in fact littering, because what littering is, is putting your waste into a public space. So I think that it's a, for the person who says that, and that includes our, uh, our local 
MP, who's, who, who said that to 4G representatives quite a while ago, well, we're so small, Canada's so small, it doesn't matter what we do. Uh, I think that if at the time I'd asked him about literary, are you in support of literary? He would have said no, and maybe we could have made a connection. Yeah, and just to add on to that just a little bit, the other thing about individual effort that makes a difference is kind of what we're talking about today. You make an individual effort, it invests, you, you become invested a little bit, and when you're invested, you're more likely to talk about it with other people, and then you start to influence, and then you're more likely to vote in the right direction as well if you've invested already your, your time and energy. And so making a difference yourself does expand beyond you. Uh, Steve Russell. Uh, <clears throat> just want to let you know about the news today with the Volkswagen deciding to build electric or a battery for electric cars in St. Thomas was uh, the announcement of today. And I would say that's a good news story for Canada and uh, creating jobs and all that sort of stuff. And I'm the engineer that is going to face my uh, uh, non climate engineers at my anniversary uh, reunion after 55 years, and I've already started the conversation with them. And the, the point being, um, uh, we got to have electricity, clean electricity, and we got to have uh, get jobs out of it. And Canada's doing a good job. And uh, so I just wanted to mention that for those that didn't know that information. Yeah, thank you very much. That is good. Yeah, Scott, can I just uh, ask if anybody's willing to address the question that somebody posed, I forget who it was, who said, what about the people who say uh, your batteries are just as bad as our oil? Um, first of all, I don't think it's actually factually correct, but that's not really the point. Uh, we need to have a, does anybody want to take a crack at giving a, uh, an empathetic answer to that kind of that question? Well, without, I mean, I've got facts and then I've got what if you don't have facts. And, and so, so if you don't have the facts, um, then, then it's kind of like, well, there's, you know, there's problems with oil, there's problems with this, but moving forward, we know the oil isn't always going to last. So that would be my, my non, my non uh, fact based one, I guess. And the climate situation is more of a crisis. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Donna wants to add to that. Yeah. Well, it's my other person. It'll be me. Um, <laughs> that is, that's a really, really tough one. And uh, one of the one one of the, the, the ways to respond to it is to talk about the fact that although some of our batteries today may not be as palatable to people as as you would hope they would be when they hear about the stories about cobalt and lithium and 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 how it's mined and all that. That that's the, the big backdrop. But what we can talk about is the fact that within the next five to 10 years, uh, that the batteries we have today are going to be replaced, or at least they're going to be alongside some other batteries that are going to be much more environmentally friendly. They're going to be potentially made out of, out of, out of sulfur and, and salt and, and aluminum. And that these products are readily available, easier to mine, less toxic to worry about. And I also remind people that, that even lithium ion batteries are 95% recyclable right back to the materials that, that you can make a new battery with. And that shocks a lot of people. They also are very, very um, unaware that even the batteries of today that we have in our vehicles um, are good for 15 years or more. And, and even after they come out of your car, when they lose some of their some of their staying power, they're still very useful for other things, uh, and like wall storage. So uh, people just don't know any of those things. And, and it, that helps a lot to allay some of their concerns. So those are some of the ways that I talk about it. Good. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think we have two recycling plants in Canada. I heard that there's one in Mississauga and another one in Montreal that's, our, that's already operating that, to recycle some of those. Even uh, I, I certainly, I know about, this, there's one in Quebec for sure. And, um, and there's also a factory or a process that's now been designed that, can recycle a, a lithium ion battery without emitting very much greenhouse gas, because that's the other negative side. When you when you heat it all up and then go through the extraction process, it, that in itself creates uh, greenhouse gas. 
but someone has invented a way to recycle a lithium ion battery without going through that process. And it is, it's about, it's a, I think it's about 5% of the emissions that the process has that, that we, that, that most operations are using today. So whether that one gets traction and, and, and we see more of it, we'll have to wait and see. So Robert, can I just ask you if you could um, change that response from a list of facts to a question to ask the person who's just asked you, I'm gonna pretend I'm that person, Robert Lockhart, your stupid batteries are just as bad as the oil I'm burning. Well, I, I, I would, I would, you know, remind people that uh, there's a huge greenhouse gas uh, footprint that, to, that getting oil out of the ground creates too. Not only getting it out, but refining it and then moving it around around the world. So, um, you know, it, 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 even even regular automobiles uh, have a huge carbon footprint uh, to produce, and uh, so. <laughs> um, that that that's something people have to remind you about as well. It's not just one side; it's not just one one vehicle doing all all of the emitting. Yeah, so if I could just add on that, there's a beautiful graphic showing the sort of tons of uh, oil that a car burns or gasoline that a car burns over its lifetime, compared to the you know half a ton or whatever it is of lithium that's consumed. Uh, so it's just graphically, there's just an enormous column for the for the emissions from the sorry from from the actual material mine to power the vehicles in the two cases, enormous for, for, for gasoline and very small for for lithium ion. And then you come back to Robert's point, but of course all of those greenhouse gases from the fossil fuels are there permanently, where and, and none of that is recyclable. Where all 95 percent of the lithium battery is recyclable. And so that over time, the amount from the from the electric vehicles is dramatically less than the amount from uh, an internal combustion engine. Yeah, so this is just reminding me of how sharing the good news is so important because, you know, listening to you folks and, and your backgrounds and the, how we can work together to learn stuff. Yeah, that's the way forward. Absolutely. Which oh, probably brings us. To almost to, to the end. To the, to the, okay, guys. Yeah, I'm actually right. <laughs> going off script, Guy and Scott. Um, so Scott and I are starting to think about planning for um, for our GMEETS presentations uh, for September to next June, um, and um, we have such a caring and um, informed audience. And so we would love to get your input. Um, if you have a topic that you would like us to um, highlight for one of our monthly presentations. If you know somebody that you think um, would be interested in doing a presentation for us, um, you could just email us at Foragy Meets. You'll get an automatic <laughs> link to register for next month, but that's okay. Um, you'll need it anyway. And then um, if a, a question that we've put out to our executive board members and some of the people on our committees um, is just asking if other people would be interested in getting involved in helping for our G meets um, on a like once every few months or a little bit more often. Um, just email us. Um, we, I think it would be good to grow our committee, our committee of two and a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more. And uh, we we do get a lot of support from the um, the executive of for our G meets, which is super appreciated, and the members. Thanks again, uh, Beth. Already, thank you. But I'll do it again uh, for coming out this evening. Uh, definitely enjoyed the uh, discussion, and I hope we weren't mm -hmm. too awkward with some of the new technology that we're playing with. And uh, we certainly look forward to uh, seeing you guys again next month for Eco Grief. Eco, eco right. Grief and Eco Anxiety. Yeah, with yeah. Um, Jessica Jessica Marion Barr, who is a professor at uh, Trent University. Bye for now, everyone. Take care. <laughs>